So uh, my name is Alan Jude, and I've been a FreeBSD server admin for 13 or so years now, uh, and started coming to BSD CAN in 2012. And uh, in 2014, I became a doc committer, and then uh, late last year, became a source committer. Uh, most of my focus has been working on stuff related to ZFS, Beehive, uh, UCL, the universal config language, implementing that in the base system, and uh, libxo, which is having the command line tools be able to output XML or JSON. Uh, I've also co-authored two books about ZFS with Michael Lucas, uh, which are for sale in the hallway if you want them, uh, FreeBSD Mastery ZFS and Advanced ZFS. I my date. Hmm? Uh, at my day job, I run a content distribution network, mostly focused on video streaming, uh, called Scale Engine. And uh, every Wednesday, I do the BSD Now podcast with Chris Moore. And on Thursdays, I do TechSnap, which is the Systems Network and Administration podcast, which is a little more focused on sysadmin stuff and is OS agnostic. Uh, and I spend most of my time doing ZFS-y things, uh, like running the uh, website or the package mirrors for PCBSD and RASBSD uh, and managing just shy of a petabyte of data on ZFS for the uh, our video streaming company. So I do a lot of stuff with ZFS, uh, helped uh, integrate ZFS into the FreeBSD installer uh, and then I integrated ZFS boot environments uh, into the installer and into the loader menu so that uh, you know, if your boot environment won't boot for you to use the B admin tool to activate a different boot environment, you can select it from the loader menu instead. And of course, Nagios is complaining. <laughs> <laughs> and Nagios will not stop, so I'm going to kill it. <coughs> uh, so I integrated the ZFS boot environment feature into the loader menu, uh, but this presented a small problem for people using uh, the encrypted ZFS support that I put in the installer. It doesn't work with boot environments because uh, at the time, in order to have an encrypted ZFS pool, you needed a second pool, uh, which we only put the slash boot directory on, so the kernel, the loader, and the loader.com. Uh, because you needed those files, uh, the boot blocks needed those files in order to actually start the operating system and load the ZFS and Jelly disk encryption modules to be able to boot the rest of the system. Uh, but when you have two pools, taking a snapshot of your root file system doesn't take a snapshot on the second pool and keeping multiple versions of the kernel in sync, it was just messy and didn't work. So uh, I was like, well, there must be a better way to do this. How hard could it be? <laughs> and yeah, so boot environments are awesome and you should use them. And if, just because you encrypt your disk doesn't mean you should be left out. Uh, so I'm a very novice C programmer. I have only really started writing C about a year ago. Uh, and I didn't read a book or anything. I just kind of started doing things. <laughs> uh, and what I managed to do after an extraordinary amount of effort <laughs> was implement a minimal version of Powell's Geli uh, disk encryption system in GPT boot for UFS and GPT ZFS boot for ZFS. Uh, so these are the small boot codes that go in a GPT partition at the front of the disk. And then normally they load the loader from the uh, UFS or ZFS partition, but uh, normally can not deal with encryption, but the versions I made can deal with the encryption. Uh, so it took quite a bit of time just to understand how the boot process worked in order to decide where to put things and how it worked. Uh, and I had to learn a lot about C. Uh, in particular, uh, as I'll describe later, the boot code, while written in C, is not the same environment as you're used to if you're doing C programming. So maybe I had the slight advantage of not being used to a regular environment. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, the existing boot code is pretty terrible. You know, once you get it working, you want to stop working on it immediately. 
and so it gets left in that state. Uh, there's, in particular, uh, a lot of the different architectures started as a copy of the closest thing that was then modified. And so there's a lot of copy-pasted code or code that is almost identical. It looks identical enough that you would try to deduplicate it and then find out there's a subtle difference. Uh, and, you know, this talk is mostly the story of all of the uh, potholes I fell into on the way to getting to it actually working. So, how do computers even work? <laughs> so, um, in your most basic BIOS type boot system, when you're booting up a computer that's formatted with a MBR based disk, uh, the BIOS reads the first 512 bytes from the disk, which is the master boot record, which has your partition table and this 446 bytes of assembly that it can then use to bootstrap the computer. Uh, so this bootstrap is executed. If you go in the source code, you'll find it. It's boot0.s, a little assembly file that picks whichever one of the four MBR partitions is marked as active and basically reads the first 512 bytes of that, which is called the volume boot record. Uh, and the source code for that is in the tree as boot1. Then that 512 bytes of assembly loads boot2, which is this smallish C program. Uh, in UFS, this is hidden in the first 15 sectors of the UFS file system, which is intentionally left empty so that that can go there. Uh, so you have to be very careful not to make that any bigger than that, because then it won't fit. And it will start clobbering the, the super block in UFS. Uh, and that small 15 sector program is just enough knowledge of UFS in order to read, well, get the inode of slash boot slash loader and read it and execute it. Uh, then that loader shows, you forks off some fourth code that draws the beastie menu that we're all happy to see every once in a while. Uh, and then that loads the kernel and your other modules or whatever, and then your OS starts and you're happy that you don't have to know how any of that works. <laughs> uh, so for ZFS, there's some a special kind of evil that happens there. So to boot ZFS, if you're using a master boot record, because ZFS doesn't leave the first 15 sectors of the file system blank, and if you can manage to read stuff from ZFS in 15 512 byte sectors of code, you're a much better programmer than I am. Uh, so in this case, you have the boot zero sitting at the front of the MBR, which reads a different boot one, which is still constrained to 512 bytes, uh, which finds the active partition and seeks to an offset of one megabyte in the ZFS uh, partition where the ZFS on disk format has this convenient hole of exactly 64 kilobytes. And that's where we stuff uh, the ZFS version of boot two. Uh, and then that uh, file can do just enough ZFS in order to read the loader from ZFS, and then that displays the BC menu, loads the kernel, and you boot. Uh, some of the interesting things, though, the, um, the boot2 file for ZFS has to pass the GUID of the ZFS pool to the loader, because you might have more than one ZFS pool, and the loader needs to know which one you're actually booting from. But it loads the loader, executes it, that loads the kernel, and your system hopefully boots. Uh, so I focused on GPT because it's much easier. <laughs> uh, so GPT is the more modern thing that was originally invented for Intel Itanium, but that's gone away. Uh, but it solves the problems of MBR, which are the fact that you could only have four partitions unless you jump through hoops with nesting a partition table in a partition. Um, and MBR was limited to two terabytes uh, per partition. So GPT doesn't have that problem and allows you to have, I think, I forget how big the partitions can be, but it's more than enough for now. And you can have up to 128 partitions uh, without having to do anything crazy. Uh, so again, at the very first 512 bytes of a GPT partition table, 
are what's called the protective MBR. Uh, so this is a fake MBR so that when Windows sees it, it doesn't say, oh, or an older version of Windows sees it, it doesn't say, oh, I see an unformatted disk. Would you like me to format that for you? <laughs> Which is a very quick way to lose your FreeBSD file system on a second hard drive on a laptop or something. Uh, so that's there, and basically it's a fake MBR that uh, has a partition table, that one fake partition that covers the whole disk. Uh, but it has that same 446-byte bootstrap that you can read from in order to you know, be compatible with an older computer. So that PMBR is a little bit of assembly, again, similar to boot zero. Uh, and what it does, instead of finding the active partition and reading the first 512 bytes of that, is it looks, specifically the FreeBSD version, looks for a partition called FreeBSD-boot, or with the type FreeBSD-boot, and reads up to 545 kilobytes. I forget why that number is that number, but it's in the assembly comments, at least a little bit. <laughs> but anyway, it reads uh, the data from that FreeBSD-boot partition, and that is basically the combination of boot one and boot two kind of slammed together. So you get uh, GPT boot if you're using UFS, or GPT ZFS boot is written there if you're using ZFS. And that code is a small thing that will then take this up to 500 kilobytes of code and copy it around in the system memory to the start location and then jump to it, and then your computer will start booting. All right, so it relocates itself in the code to the right offsets in memory and then executes the boot two, uh, which is where I injected all this knowledge about Geli, which then can read and execute the loader, which then, uh, or the ZFS loader, which is basically when we compile FreeBSD, we make loader and then we make ZFS loader, which is the same code, but with an if def for ZFS turned on the second time. Uh, and that starts the kernel. Uh, so I had figured out how the system booted and I was looking at, let's start teaching it how to do encryption. Uh, so my first plan was to make a copy of GPT ZFS boot and call it GPT Geli boot. Uh, and then the idea there was to make a single boot file that would be able to boot UFS or ZFS uh, and be Geli enabled and so on. Uh, I looked at that, but quickly found out that the GPT boot and GPT ZFS boot are very close, but subtly different in a couple of places. And it was more work than I wanted to do to figure out if they could be combined easily. Uh, and so that's future work I hope to eventually get back to at some point. Uh, so but then I decided it would be easier to just implement Geli in both of those separately. Uh, and so there's also the ZFS boot is the MBR version, which is the one that is size constrained to 64 kilobytes. So I had to watch out for that too. Uh, in particular, when I got started, it was very hard because you can't really debug the boot code. You make changes, you write it to the boot sector, you try to boot, and if you're lucky, something happens. If you're not, the, the little cursor just sits there and blinks. Uh, or, you know, the BTX client crashes, or you just get triple fault and you crash VirtualBox. You're like, hmm, let's try that on my hardware, and your laptop just reboots in a loop. <laughs> it's like, well, you know, I thought some error messages that FreeBSD kernel spat out sometimes were unintelligible, but it's better than just nothing. Complete silence. Uh, right, so the first problem to solve was, how do I tell if this partition is encrypted or not? Uh, luckily, with the geom system in FreeBSD, there's a standard of the very last sector contains the metadata, and it's easy to tell. Uh, so we looked at the very last sector on the disk, which turns out to be a little harder to find than you would think. Uh, and we parsed that and looked for the string geom ELI, which is uh, in a specific place. And if it has that, then we know it's Geli encrypted. And if it doesn't, then it's not, and we don't have to worry about it. Uh, so it turned out my life was made slightly easier by the way the ZFS code works. 
uh, instead of reading from the disk directly, uh, when you tell ZFS to you know, read, see if this disk is ZFS, uh, it takes a callback for the function that will actually read the data from the disk. And so it was easy to swap that out with a new, a new function that would decrypt the data on the way from the hard drive before we feed it to ZFS. Uh, so we just conditionally replace this function with one that decrypts it on the way, and now ZFS gets unencrypted data instead of encrypted data, and all of a sudden it actually tastes like ZFS instead of randomness. Uh, UFS didn't do this, but I adapted it slightly so that it would, so I could just use that same intermediate function for both and share that between the, the two different boot codes. So after we figure out if a partition is encrypted, uh, the next thing you want to do is decrypt it. Uh, so we pull up the Geli metadata and then reuse the functions that are built into Geli uh, in order to find out what version of Geli it is and what hash and encryption and so on it was using. So we get the algorithm, the key size, and the encrypted master key. So then we have to decrypt the master key. Uh, so we had to prompt the user for the password, which I thought would be the hardest part of this and actually was one of the easiest. Um, one big caveat here is currently we do not support uh, decrypting it if you also used key files. So the way Geli works is you have a password which is run through PKCS v5 some large number of times to generate the key, but you can also have arbitrary files full of whatever you want that are mixed in there as well before it's HMAC, right? Um, the metadata never indicates if keys were used or not, which is extra security, but it makes it hard for the boot code to tell if there were key files or just a password. Uh, so one of the things I had to do eventually was add a flag to the Geli metadata to indicate that this is a pool that's compatible with Geli boot, meaning it was only using a password, not just a, uh, not also not using key files and so on. In particular, this was just so that uh, if you, you know, upgrade FreeBSD and suddenly you have support for the Geli boot code, it doesn't just say, oh, an encrypted disk, let me prompt you for a password for that. Uh, but because you used a key file, even if you type in the right password, you didn't provide the key file, so it's the wrong password, and then you just have to fail a bunch of password prompts before you can actually continue booting. <laughs> anyway, I'll get back to that. Uh, so I started reusing code from Geli in the bootloader, detect ZFS, and actually de get the key I need to actually start decrypting the files, but then I needed crypto. So in Geli, it uses the kernel crypto APIs, uh, or OpenSSL, both of which are not available in the kernel, or the bootloader, and wouldn't fit anyway. Uh, so in my very first version of this, I went and looked for a small AES implementation that was permissively licensed so I could use it. And I found this thing called Tiny AES C, which is a small implementation of AES in C that I could use. Uh, it had only AES CBC, but that was good enough to get started with. Uh, and of course, it was only AES CBC 128, which isn't very good, but again, enough to get started with and nice and small. Uh, so with that and borrowing a couple of functions from Geli to deal with uh, deriving the sector keys and all that, uh, and checking for the Geli version and setting the right flags, depending on what version of Geli you have, you do things slightly differently. Uh, I was then able to decrypt and validate the master key and use that to calculate the HMAC to get the, to validate the master key and then calculate the sector key and the initialization vectors and actually start decrypting individual sectors. Uh, one of the problems was it turned out that Geli uses one of every hash. <laughs> Probably not on purpose originally, but uh, Everything in Geom uses uh, an MD5 on the metadata just to, as a consistency check uh, because it's shorter, takes less of the 512 bytes of available space than something like a SHA-256 would. Um, 
So I needed an implementation of MD5 to make sure that the metadata wasn't corrupted. Uh, then a SHA-256 is used to generate the uh, unpredictable sector initialization value. Uh, and then a SHA-512 is used as an HMAC over a bunch of other things. Uh, so elsewhere in the boot code, uh, often what is done is just a pound include of another C file. Uh, but you couldn't do that for you know, including SHA-256 and 512 because they have some conflicting macros and a bunch of other things. Uh, and that just didn't work out very well. So then originally what I did was add them into libstand, which is a library of small things in the bootloader that are pulled in. Uh, but eventually, instead of exploding the size of libstand with a bunch of different things I ended up needing over time, I created a libgellyboot, which is a little .a static library of all the various bits of code I needed in the uh, boot code. Uh, so then I needed to prompt for a password uh, from the user. So I borrowed this getster function uh, from the boot code. It was already there, uh, used for other things. Uh, I made a copy of it and modified it. So instead of echoing the character you typed, it echoed a star, right? So it doesn't display your password as you're typing it. Uh, the problem is that code uh, and the loader work differently because the loader supports serial. <laughs> um, and so it basically had a slightly different version of the function. And so I needed two different versions that printed with the star. and It quickly got complicated. Uh, and as you'll see on the next slide, it turns out both of those and I think six other copies of similar functions in the FreeBSD boot loader all contain the same bug. Uh, it's not a very big deal, but it's a bug. Um, so I ended up actually borrowing the ngets uh, from libstand, which is actually borrowed from NetBSD, and wrote a version of it for passwords, put it in my library, and used it throughout the whole boot code. Uh, so here, uh, this would have been a good one for the style 9 argument we had earlier this year about explicit uh, curly braces. So getster or ngets and so on, uh, take a string in from the console, but you set the maximum size of the string, right? So after so many characters, you'll stop accepting, right? So you say, accept input from the user up to this many characters. Uh, it works here, but you continue to echo the characters to the screen after they've exceeded the limit instead of not. So the user isn't aware that the extra characters they're typing aren't actually being saved anywhere uh, because this should be inside that if instead of not. I didn't notice that originally. Actually, that was uh, Jin Li when he did the sec team review of this Gelly code, of the bootloader. Anyway, so I took it out from my first test drive uh, with the expectation that boot two would start, taste the partition, figure out that it's Gelly encrypted, read the, ma the encrypted master key, uh, prompt the user for the password, derive the key from that, decrypt the master key, then use that to read individual sectors, and we'd be good. Instead, VirtualBox says triple fault, blah, 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 and then VirtualBox crashes and goes away entirely. <laughs> you know, I'm a novice C programmer and know nothing about hardware. I don't even know what a triple fault means. <laughs> so I tried it on one of my spare laptops, and all it did was reboot in a loop. I was like, okay, where'd it go from here? Uh, so it turns out, uh, that GPT LDR, little, basically the GPT version of boot one, the little 512 byte assembly code that copies the actual, whatever you put in the FreeBSD boot partition to the right place in memory and then jumps to it and executes it. Uh, because it runs in real mode, which is basically 16 bit, uh, it only copies the first 64 kilobytes of that code. Even though the partition can contain 545 kilobytes of data, it copies the first 64K which was fine because the boot code for UFS was 16 kilobytes and ZFS was 42 kilobytes. And it was never going to get much bigger until some goofy person started adding encryption to it. <laughs> uh, at this time, uh, GPT-ZFS boot had an AES implementation 
MD5, SHA256, SHA512, a whole bunch of bits of Geli copy and pasted into it and so on. So it was over 90 kilobytes. Well, if you only use the first 64 kilobytes of a 90 kilobyte binary, it doesn't turn out so well. <laughs> and basically, the instruction pointer would get into just uninitialized memory and triple fault. Uh, so I tried a bunch of things to try to teach the assembly to copy more than 64 kilobytes. I'm like, I don't know anything about assembly, but uh, you know, maybe if I change some things, I'd just tell it, hey, copy more blocks, right? It's, it, it copies blocks a smaller amount of time and has just a uh, define that tells it how many, copy, how many blocks to copy. So I increase the number, and then the assembler is like, you can't do that, and changes it back. <laughs> so we'll get back to solving that problem later. I just want to know if this actually works. So I stuck to making it work for UFS, because a 14 kilobyte binary plus encryption is still under the 64K. Uh, so I reworked that callback that ZFS used to read from the disk and made UFS do the same thing so I could decrypt on the way and you know, fiddled with the decryption a little bit to make it work, and it worked. Uh, so GPT boot decrypted the root pool and was able to read the loader from it and fire up the loader, and the loader immediately failed and said, this file system is just full of junk. I, it's not UFS. <laughs> it's like, oh, right, I have to teach the loader how to do Geli now. Uh, so yes, the boot code has a, is a very constrained environment. Uh, you know, there's no kernel yet. There's no libc. Uh, you don't actually even have malloc or panic. <laughs> Basically, the only debugging you have is printf. And even the printf can only do unsigned integers. It, it doesn't know about signedness. <laughs> um, uh, one of the other problems was because it uses libstand instead of libc and so on, uh, if you try to use code from elsewhere in the system that pulls in string.h or strings.h, those symbols then, or definitions then conflict with the libstand version, which are different uh, because they are used like integers instead of the bigger types and so on. Uh, and in order to allow you to do anything, uh, there's a very small implementation of malloc in uh, the boot code. Uh, but basically what it does is define an area of about three megabytes of memory on the heap and then keep track of a cursor of where you are in that. And every time you malloc, it just moves the cursor ahead that many bytes. And then that's your pointer. Uh, and so there's no free because, you know, if you free up something in the middle of that, you can't reuse it. Uh, so you have a very limited amount of memory and you can't, once you've used it, it's gone. <laughs> uh, so then I had to teach the loader to speak Geli. So the first thing to do there was find where in the loader can I basically do this intercept of the blocks as they're coming off the disk before they get to the file system or the code that's trying to interpret them. So I looked around and basically followed, I think it's six levels of indirection that happened, <laughs> and eventually found that in libi386, is the lowest level function that actually does, you know, the BIOS calls to read, read a sector from the disk, read a sector from the disk, et cetera. Uh, so in there, I found that, you know, there is a function uh, in the read strategy that I could just say, hey, oh, you know, if this disk is encrypted, uh, then, or keep a list of disks that are encrypted. If the read is from one of those, then let's decrypt it. Uh, as future work, it would be interesting to look at uh, the updated uh, block cache that ZF, or FreeBSD's bootloader got um, and see if it could be implemented in there instead uh, so it would be compatible with more devices and, and so on. I don't know that it really makes any sense, but what if you had an encrypted CD you wanted to boot from or something? Right now that wouldn't work. But, uh, having it a little more layered instead of just kind of stuck in the middle of one of the regular functions uh, might be better. So after teaching the loader how to decrypt, which was only a couple of slides, but it was like two months of effort, <laughs> I had my first successful boot of a Geli encrypted disk, but it was only AES CBC 128. Uh, it didn't do ZFS, 
I was getting close to the binary limit already, uh, and it was only UFS, and the whole point of this for me was ZFS. <laughs> so I'd accomplished some things, but none of the things I wanted to do. <laughs> so I needed to overcome the 64 kilobyte limit on GPT LDR. Uh, so how to get past that? First I tried, you know, compile with optimize for size. That'll make it smaller, right? Uh, it makes it like one kilobyte bigger. <laughs> uh, so optimize two, uh, O2 is actually slightly bigger than O1, uh, which is probably what you expect. I tried increasing the number of blocks that get copied, but the assembler just laughed at me. Um, I tried converting the assembly to 32-bit so it could copy more than 64K at a time. Uh, then the CPU laughed at me. <laughs> uh, so I started asking people uh, on the FreeBSD project. So I asked Aiden Adler, and he looked at trying to do the 32-bit uh, conversion of those codes, but I don't know if that would actually work during the boot anyway. Or then he looked at copying two blocks of 64K instead of just one, but he had no time to keep working on that. Uh, at first, John Mark Gurney seemed receptive to working on this for me, uh, but once he understood the scope and the existing code and what the problem was, uh, he, quick, he was quick to suggest I ask someone else. <laughs> <laughs> so then I asked John Baldwin, who originally wrote GPT LDR, uh, I think when he was at Yahoo, uh, and he suggested finding some other way to do it, like making a new partition that would only contain the loader and then teaching just the loader how to do uh, Gelly and so on. Uh, then at VBSDCon last September, uh, I asked uh, Peter Grehan, who originally seemed interested in helping me do this. Uh, but once he understood the scope of the work and what the problem was, uh, he instead tried to teach me how to use QMU to debug the assembly and figure it out myself. <laughs> but I don't know any assembly, so that was not going to go very well. Uh, and one of my friends, Dylan, was at uh, the VBSD conference as well, and he started working on a draft of new assembly to do it, and you know, he was, I had a calculator and drawing the stack on a piece of paper and trying to figure it out. Uh, but once the conference was over, he had to go back to work and didn't continue working on it. Uh, so I kind of took a little break from that code for a while because it was stuck. But then uh, about a month later, we were in Stockholm for EuroBSDCon 2015 at the Dev Summit. Uh, and Colin Percival had overheard about my plight. Uh, and he approached me and said, you know, 16-bit assembly is the only assembly I, I've ever learned. And, you know, I haven't used it since I was in school. <laughs> but I know how to do that. I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, so he started working on a patch for me uh, that day at the Dev Summit, uh, and he sent me a patch, and I tried it, uh, but immediately all it did was crash the BTX. Uh, sorry. So then the next night he tried again, and all, it still crashed. And he tried each night at the while well, we were in Stockholm, but couldn't quite get it working. Uh, so we went home, and I assumed we were stuck again. But after just a few days, uh, Colin pings me on IRC, and he had a new patch. Uh, this one still only copied the first 64K, but it did it by copying two blocks of 32K instead. Uh, and we tried it, and that worked. I was like, oh. Uh, so then he modified it so it would copy four blocks of 32K, and it worked. So all of a sudden, we can do 128K, which is enough. And also, it's just a number, and you can tweak it and do more in the future. Uh, so now. It works, and it's future-proof. <laughs> uh, so then the problem was, nobody wants to encrypt their disk with AES CBC 128. They want to use AES XDS 256. Um, so the first approach was, all right, I will just copy and paste that from the kernel into the boot code. Uh, and, you know, fake out a bunch of defines for string.h and other stuff. Uh, but eventually, uh, I managed to, you know, include it properly by putting it in that libgelly boot uh, and being able to use the symbols. Uh, I'd only tried a little bit of uh, actually defining underscore string underscore h underscore so that uh, when you include string.h, it's like, oh, I've already been included. I'll just not do anything. <laughs> So I did that, and then I needed AES XTS from OpenCrypto, uh, which was the implementation that's in the FreeBSD kernel. 
Uh, the problem was Open Crypto basically is a bunch of files for offloading to hardware and then it has backup software implementations and basically has this xform.c, which is one big C file with an implementation of all the different supported crypto and HMAC algorithms. Uh, I'm in a constrained environment and don't have very much space. I don't need to throw triple desks and Camellia and Blowfish and Skipjack and every other crypto algorithm in there. Uh, and the ASX, it all you know, used the kernel al uh, memory allocator, which is even different than regular malloc, uh, and is twice as not supported in the bootloader. <laughs> Uh, so I, again, went to the, I'll just copy that one set of functions I need out and modify them to, you know, just use stack memory instead of the, uh, using malloc. Uh, and with that, thanks to Colin, I finally had UFS and ZFS uh, with AES XTS 256 working and everybody was happy. And it actually supported CBC as well in case that you picked that before or you knew better or something. Um, but it was an ugly mess. Uh, it was full of printfs and copy-pasted code, and it was terrible. So I switched to uh, including Rheindahl, but that was still a mess. So I eventually put that in the libgelly boot. Uh, that didn't work for ASXCS because the uh, open crypto thing was all of the algorithms, so I couldn't just reuse it. Um, so I asked some people about it, and they're like, well, you know, you could break it up, but like, you would let me do that? <laughs> uh, so I actually used the SVN copy command to make a copy of xform.c for each different algorithm, and then deleted the other out. So basically, I broke the file up into one file per algorithm, but in such a way that the diff showed me just deleting code, never adding code, so you could see that I didn't actually modify any of the algorithms. So I made a very big patch that was hard to read, but proved that I didn't change any of the algorithms and break them. Uh, but they let me commit that, so. <laughs> um, most of the Gelly code had survived completely unmodified except for one particular case. There was a struct uh, Gelly soft C uh, that I, I didn't need most of the internals and stuff from Gelly, so I had actually used the struct for the metadata, the on-disk metadata, because that was the only stuff I was actually using because I wasn't actually implementing geom and, and the whole ELI thing. Uh, but I did some uh, work, undid that, and went back to using the Gelly Soft C. Uh, I had to, there's one field in there that's a Boolean, it's defined in the type that only exists in the kernel, so I had to change that so that the, uh, you could compile it in user land. Uh, and I think I had to move two if def kernels around in Gelly and got Powell to review it and make sure I didn't break anything. Uh, and I ran the regression suite and everything was okay and he let me commit that. And so now you can reuse parts of Gelly in user land if you really want to. Uh, but that was enough to allow me to pull that in and basically not have to use any code, uh, to use all the code from Gelly unmodified instead of having to modify it. Uh, there was only one function that I had to replace from Gelly, and that was the one that actually does the encryption and decryption, because I'm not using the kernel framework or OpenSSL. I'm calling, uh, you know, AES directly instead. Uh, so now, it all works. Yay. Uh, my test system was mirrored SSDs, though. So you fire up the machine, boot two starts, and it's like, all right, I need your password to decrypt the disk to load the loader. So you type in your password. And it's like, oh, you have two disks. I need to drip the second one. Please enter your password again. So you do. Uh, then it loads the loader, and the loader's like, oh, great. Uh, but I need your password in order to read the kernel. So you type your password. And oh, you have a second disk. I'm going to need that too. Type your password again. Uh, then GM ELI fires up, and when you get to the mount root prompt, the kernel's like, hey, I need your password to decrypt your disk. Type your password <laughs> one, two more times. So now you've typed your password six times. Yes, we use six passwords. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so luckily at EuroBSDCon in Bulgaria uh, two years ago, uh, Colin and Chris Moore had worked together to implement a password caching system so that if you typed your password in at the loader, it would be able to pass it 
into Geom so that it wouldn't comp for it at the uh, mount root prompt. Uh, main advantage of that is the mount root prompt late arriving USB devices can like clobber the password prompt and you don't see it, any D message stuff coming up. So prompting it in the loader in, you know, where you're basically have the user hostage until they enter the password and it's obvious to them that that's what's going on, uh, works better. So he had that uh, and so I was like, okay, in the loader I can do, I can take advantage of that and pass the password from the loader to the kernel uh, the exact same way and problem solved. Now you're down from six to four prompts. Getting there. <laughs> uh, so now you have it twice per disk, once in boot two and once in loader. So how do I pass data from boot two, which is before there's an operating system, basically the code I've written is the entire operating system at this point, uh, and the loader. Luckily, if you remember, ZFS, uh, you need to pass the globally unique ID of the pool from boot two to the loader. So it actually passes it as arguments when it calls exec on the, the loader binary. Uh, but it doesn't just do that. It has this ZFS boot arg struct, uh, which starts with the first member being size, of which you stuff, you know, size of the struct in it, and then all the members. But then in the loader, every time you want to access a member, you first check the offset of the member. And if the offset is greater than the size, it means the boot code you were using has an older version of the struct where that member doesn't exist, and you know that you can't use that, so you don't read past the end of the, the data there. So this allows you to future-proof making the struct bigger by checking that the struct is the size you expect, or at least the size of the member you're trying to access. So as long as you don't reorder anything, it's fine. <laughs> uh, so I basically added a new member to the end of that uh, that holds the Gelly password, and uh, for UFS, I basically implemented the same thing so that we can use that for UFS as well. And as soon as it's pulled into the loader, it zeroes it out in memory so that it's not like laying around somewhere that's not gonna get overwritten or something. Uh, so yes, the things that are left to do for this are that uh, currently Gellyboot only supports using passphrases, no key files. Uh, so after consulting with uh, Powell at the FreeBSD Storage Summit earlier uh, this year, we decided that probably the best way is to uh, create a new partition type on GPD called FreeBSD Gelly Key or something to that effect, and you would just you know, make a 4K partition or whatever and stick your key file in there, and it would read that random data and mix it in with the password, and now you have that. Uh, ideally, you would keep that on a separate device, like a USB key or something. Uh, although I haven't tested how well, you know, if the system boots up and it's at the password prompt and you decide then to plug in the USB stick, that's probably not gonna work and you have to reboot again. That could be annoying, but we'll see how easy it is to actually find your key on a USB stick when you're booting from the hard drive. In particular, you know, you don't want to boot from the USB stick to be able to boot your system necessarily. Did you have a comment? Sure. <laughs> yes. Uh, so one of the things, uh, so when you enter the password, when we try a second disk inside the same program, we first try the old password. And if not, uh, and don't count that against the three tries you get before it gives up. So it is passed in clear text between the boot two and the loader, although the loader zeroes it out as soon as it reads it, and then, yeah, so it's not great, but it does get zeroed out after everything. So then, then uh, if somebody hijacks your system and puts uh, Yeah, although they would have to have your encryption key in order to modify the kernel because it was stored on the encrypted partition, right? Kernel change, yes, it's, yeah. Uh, 
Right, but it is easier for them to hijack the boot code and just get the password in plain text even if you weren't passing it anywhere. Uh, from the boot code, you cannot do much from the boot code. You don't have network, you don't have storage. So can I I've, I've seen somebody implement TCP IP in Fickle, so. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's easier at that point, yes. But it's not totally feasible as you see that the TCP access for boot is quite simple enough to just change the boot code and use a dollar. You can basically ask for the password and then the process of original or that will add that original text of original transcription and maybe some information. Yeah. And so perhaps so some permutation device will take it over. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm just not. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, so. We'll, 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 yeah. Yes. Yeah. We'll, we'll get to a little bit of that in a, a few minutes, actually. Uh, so, yeah. Hopefully, we can come up with something so that you can have your. Uh, instead of just a passphrase, you also have a four kilobyte random key or something on a USB stick. Uh, that's required in addition to you typing in the passphrase to boot the system properly. Yeah, one way to kind of limit it is just the boot code, so you have uh, exposure to the password. So basically, you can, uh, instead of using the password to encrypt the disk, uh, you basically first uh, do some kind of simple uh, uh, secure hash of it. So the, the, key, the key that's used to decrypt the master key for Geli is derived your password is run through like PKCSB5 a hundred thousand times first. Yeah, but you would need the, the right thing to actually decrypt it. So you can't do a one-way hash because then you don't have it to, yeah. So um, the next thing is we want to support this in EFI, uh, which when I presented this in Tokyo, I hope to do in time for BSD CAN. Uh, luckily, Eric McCorkle did it for me. <laughs> uh, so that's out for review now, uh, but it's not committed. Uh, but it, you can try it out, and it works. Um, and he implemented things slightly differently in a few places. And one of the things he wants to do uh, is instead of passing the plain text passphrase between the things, uh, at least it's for uh, right now. We take the passphrase and we redo the PKC v5 thing uh, in boot2 and the loader. Whereas if instead we actually passed the passphrase after it had been through pkcsv5 uh, the first time, it would just save you the time of waiting for it to happen the second time because it runs a lot slower in the pre-boot environment than it does normally. Um, so there's a bunch of improvements like that we could probably make. Uh, you know, remember, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's that. and. Uh, He's also looking at being able to do secure boot using the TPM uh, and, uh, or an HSM to store the key instead of passing it around between things and stuff like that. So hopefully he can take this and make it much better. I just wanted ZFS boot environments to work. Would be much better, yes. Uh, so there's a question of, you know, Geli supports a bunch of other algorithms, but I don't think they're worth implementing, uh, mostly because of the size constraints. Uh, and I, we'd have to do a survey, I suppose, to find out, but I imagine most people are using one of the AES-based algorithms because AES-XDS accelerates that so much that I don't know how many people are encrypting their disk with Blowfish. Yes. They can do it themselves. <laughs> yeah, uh, and you know I have lots of other things I can work on. Yeah, uh, the installer doesn't. It always uses AES XDS. So I imagine most of the people that this is targeted at uh, will definitely be using the algorithms I implemented. Um, and yes, so if you want to try out the UEFI code, there's a call for testing out on the mailing list about two weeks ago. 
Uh, there's also a blog post explaining some of the design decisions and so on. Uh, so if security type people wanted to review that, that'd be great. Um, and then, what, um, so in the EFI code, it's all layered properly. So there's like a module for each file system and then a module for Geli that can just be superimposed in between uh, the file system and it's a much better design than my, you know, if def Geli in the middle of the function that reads from the disk and so on. Uh, so hopefully that design's much better and supersedes all my work, but for now, Yeah, it's whatever your computer boots with. <laughs> yeah, it's whatever your BIOS does. So that could be a complication. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, and you know, if I think Johannes's laptop, the keyboard doesn't work that early in the boot. <laughs> yeah, but no, this is before Quirks even, right? Boot two is even earlier than that. It it doesn't look at anything like that. So, so you're screwed. Well, well, in the bootloader, the keyboard works, and then after the bootloader, when it goes to the kernel, ah, that's when it stops working. Okay. Then you lose the code. Okay. Oh, quick real quick, did you commit to your dream song? Yes, I got committed uh, by release engineering yesterday. Uh, uh, so some other things that it might be worth looking at, uh, you know, uh, recently I implemented SHA-512 truncated to 256 bits uh, for ZFS into the FreeBSD, uh, and it's about 50% faster on 64-bit to calculate the SHA-512 and only use the first half of it as it is to do the SHA-256. It uses a different initialization vector, so it's not actually just the first half of a SHA-512, but it's the same algorithm. Uh, maybe a new version, uh, increment the version number of Geli once and switch all of them to doing that. I don't know if the performance enhancement would actually be worth it, though. Um, there's lots of cleanup stuff that can be done to uh, make the boot code more manageable and to reuse code in places instead of copy pasting it. Um, and you know, fixing that getster bug in the six or eight places where it exists. <laughs> um, and still getting back to that project of having one loader for UFS and ZFS instead of the user having to pick and install the right one. Uh, one of the issues I ran into there is what if the user has one file system of each, how do we decide which one they want to boot from? Uh, although we, maybe we can implement that as a GPT partition flag or something. Uh, and then uh, something I think Sean asked for, as maybe a concept was, so I have my Geli encrypted USB stick that I keep a bunch of files on, and it'd be really handy if I could load that on Linux every once in a while. Uh, and after seeing how nicely laid out Geli is and how simple it is to actually use, uh, it's like, Maybe somebody could write a fuse Geli module so that you can mount Geli encrypted disks on other operating systems. Uh, of course, most of them don't support UFS, but I guess ZFS now. Uh, it'd be really nice to have your encrypted ZFS USB stick and be able to import it on other operating systems. And maybe the audience has some other ideas. Yeah, you know, you'd just implement Geli in the pixie boot thing. <laughs> Have fun with that. <laughs> oh, but which one? Like, oh, GDBE? Um, it wouldn't be that hard. You would have to just change the functions that read the metadata to recognize GBDE, and then. Yeah. So GBDE uses MD5 in more places than it should, and uh, a couple other things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the biggest problem would probably be the eventual code size. So you would end up with a different, like GPT, GBDE boot, yeah. but uh, uh, it could be done. Uh, 
Um, most of the code for AES CBC and AES, AES XTS is the sh same. The AES XTS has the tweak instead. Otherwise, it's pretty much the same. Uh, but it, all the Geli stuff is if def, so you can do uh, without loader Geli boot or something like that, and it will compile it out. Because uh, if you made your FreeBSD dash boot partition too small, uh, following the old instructions of making it like 64K instead of 512K, then this new 90 kilobyte one won't fit in there. So like the FreeBSD cluster, some of their machines can't actually be upgraded to this because uh, they made the little partition too small. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's boot uh, one, GPT LDR. Yes. Oh, well, sorry. Boot one relocating boot two. It's already been loaded by boot zero into memory, but not in the right place. And so it copies it backwards because it might be overwriting the beginning of it. Uh, Yeah, 16-bit mode assembly. Uh, and so the biggest register or whatever is 64K. So you have to do it in chunks. And Colin just did 32K chunks at a time so that if the alignment's off, it still fits. Uh, like 0x7z0, whatever it is. Yeah, I don't know anything about it. You can look at gptldr.s. In boot one, no, it's still only 512 bytes, I think. Actually, for GPT, yes. Uh, the, you know, our, our PMBR can do up to 540 kilobytes, so yes, you would be able to fit that in there if you wanted. Yes, the number of uh, rounds is stored in the metadata. When you do Geli init, if you don't specify, it tries until, it figures out approximately how many rounds it will take for your CPU to spend three seconds on it. And it uses that number. Cool. Uh, and yeah, it's stored in the metadata because you need to do exactly the same number of rounds to get the same password out of it. So, so the, the recode can look at? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it handles the case where it's zero. Uh, which I thought was what indicated you use keys, but it turns out you never indicate that you use keys files because you get more privacy that way. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, when the loader starts up, it tastes all the hard drives as they're registered in the loader, uh, and Makes, has an array and it knows every hard drive and whether or not it's encrypted, or each partition and whether or not it's encrypted. Then in the code that reads from the disk, uh, it's like, oh, if the partition you're reading from was Geli, it decrypts it before it passes it back up to the higher layer. But this much code. The, yeah. Okay. It wouldn't be, yeah, I didn't think it would make enough of a difference anyway. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then the other thing I have is, obviously, I wrote the, our, the second ZFS book just came out about a month ago. Uh, and 
again, it's for sale in the hallway. Uh, <laughs> but uh, this one covers using boot environments, so that's why it was important for me to make sure it worked with Gelly encrypted boot environments. Um, also, how to delegate file systems to, so, you know, allow this user to send receives without root privileges, or, you know, allow this data set to be used in a jail, so root in the jail can create and destroy and do whatever they want to this data set, but not touch the rest of my file system. Uh, how to optimize ZFS block storage for iSCSI, MySQL, Postgres, BitTorrent, whatever different workloads you have. Uh, how to select the right caching strategies, you know, when you need a, a slog and so on. Uh, I even have some stuff in there about using uh, ZFS with NVMe devices. Uh, I got to borrow a machine in the FreeBSD test cluster that has a uh, Intel PCI SSD or PCI NVMe that could do 3,800 megabytes per second. <laughs> that was fun. Uh, and then how to figure out where the bottleneck is when you're using ZFS and some strategies for dealing with it in various ways. And a small tour through the ZDB command to actually do things like print out your metadata slabs and your space maps so you can actually see, you know, that histogram that uh, Matt was showing in his talk yesterday. Yes. Yes, and if you've never seen it before, uh, if you go to bsdnow.tv, Chris Moore and I do a weekly video podcast about everything that happens in the BSD community, and it includes an uh, interview with a developer every week. Uh, so the interviews are awesome, uh, and you should do an interview too. <laughs> so get in touch with us, guests at bsdnow.tv, and let us know, and we will come up with some questions, email them to you ahead of time so that you have time to think of what you're going to say, and then you come on and we interview you for like 20 minutes. It's easy. Don't worry about it. And then I also do TechSnap, you know, if you're just a sysadmin and don't want to hear developers talking about how they do things, and that's the sysadmin podcast. But you should watch BSD now. The interviews are awesome. You know, we interview Powell and John and Hans-Peter and 150 other people. Thank you. <laughs>